Hey, future physicists. So we're looking at Newton's second law. So in the last video, we talked about Newton's first law. And remember, objects in motion tend to stay in motion in a straight line at a constant speed unless acted on by an outside force. And objects at rest tend to stay at rest unless acted on by an outside force. So the next logical thought to that is, hey, if we want to talk about how to get an object to move, if an object's resting and wants to stay resting, how do we ever move it? If an object's moving and wants to keep moving, then how do we ever stop it from moving? And that's really where that whole idea of the outside force comes from. It's an outside force. So we would look at it and say, okay, so when I put a force on an object, that force is directly proportional to the acceleration of an object. So as the force gets bigger, the acceleration gets bigger. And I can say that with an equation that has this ichthus symbol, it's a fishy symbol. It doesn't look very good here in the font, but it's sort of that, that uh, three quarters of an infinity symbol. And we would say that the force is directly proportional to the acceleration. So as the force gets bigger, so does the acceleration. Now there's another aspect to that. We can think that if I have, like I used in the previous video, an example of a bowling ball versus a kickball, there's a difference that that mass makes between the two objects. So that as the mass of an object gets smaller, then the object will accelerate more. So it's way easier to get a kickball to move than it would be a bowling ball. You wouldn't want to kick the bowling ball. And we would say that one over the mass, as the mass gets smaller, the acceleration gets bigger. So that's an inverse relationship. So the mass is inversely proportional to the acceleration. Now, if we put those two together, that kind of is where we get the second law. So Newton's second law, force makes an object want to accelerate mass makes an object not want to accelerate. So force makes an object want to accelerate, mass makes an object not want to accelerate. And if we put those two formulas together, so remember we have that the force is proportional to the acceleration and the one over the mass is proportional to the acceleration and we put them both together into this equation, then we can look at that and say, hey, I wanna turn this into an equality now, but the way I have to do that is say, it's not necessarily equal, but if we put in a proportionality constant, then it would be equal. Now, lucky for us, in this case, that constant is equal to one, but not in all cases. And as we study more, then you'll see more of the different situations where that proportionality constant changes. So we end up getting this, uh, that the acceleration is the force divided by the mass, or if we rewrite it, then we come up with Newton's famous second law, F equals MA, or force equals mass times acceleration. Some things that you should probably know that the unit for this we have defined to be the Newton in honor of Sir Isaac Newton. It is the amount of force necessary to accelerate a one kilogram mass at one meter per second squared. So you could picture one kilogram for your mass, kilograms being the standard physics unit, and one meter per second squared, meters per second squared being the standard acceleration unit, and that's how we define what a Newton would be. So one Newton is one kilogram meters per second squared. It would be like you holding 100 grams in your hand. That's about what that force is, amount, is the amount of. Or another way, if you're really familiar with pounds, you can think of it that as one pound is about four Newtons. So at one Newton is really roughly a fourth of a pound. Okay, moving on. So the net force in the y direction usually cancels out to zero. So if we remember from this, we had a box here. We uh, put that all down into a force diagram. So I would draw a dot in the middle and I would think through all the forces that are acting on this moving box. So the first thing I would say is gravity is pulling it down. Unless I'm not on the earth, I'm always going to have that gravity, gravity pulling on me. Uh, if I'm on a, sub a surface and I'm not moving up or down, then remember that there is this normal force. Remember, N stands for normal, and normal doesn't mean like, like it's not weird or not unusual. It means that it is perpendicular, so it's perpendicular to the surface. I'm going to have a force of friction that's acting against the motion, so if I assume the block is moving in the direction I'm pulling it, then friction have, has to be acting against me. And then the force of me or the force of you pulling it forward is what's going to do it. Now, remember, the net force in the y direction usually cancels out. So I can look at this and say, hey, if this isn't moving up or down, then these two forces really have to cancel out. So another situation then, I'm sorry, so I have the net force is equal to zero. If I take this, the net force, remember net means sum of, I would have the normal force going up as positive minus gravity, minus because it's going down. And then if I take that to the other side, I would say the normal has to equal the gravity.
If I'm pulling at an angle, then I become slightly different problem here. So again, I still have the gravity, I still have the normal force, I still have friction, but now I'm pulling it at an angle. And what you can kind of think of is if you're pulling it at this angle, then you're not only pulling it in the X direction, but you're also lifting up on it a little bit, which means that the ground or the normal force doesn't have to put nearly as much force on it as it did over here whenever you were pulling on the um, without an angle. So together, these two forces have to be equal to the force of gravity. So I would say the net force in the Y direction is equal to zero. So I can say the normal force plus the Y force has to be equal to the force of gravity. Uh, so the up forces have to equal the down forces. Now in the X direction, that's usually what causes the direction or the motion is I can say, looking back at the snow angle one then, that the net force is going to be the X component, which is from what I have above here, the U, the force of U, minus the force of friction, because friction is acting against you, equals the mass times the acceleration. So now if I look at the angle problem, then wouldn't I end up getting something that is very similar to what is over here? I would have the X component of the U minus the force of friction, and that's going to have to equal the mass times the acceleration. Now, there is a special case that we would want to talk about, and that special case is when we have a constant velocity. So remember, constant velocity means there is no acceleration. And if there's no acceleration, then that whole right side of the equation, ma goes away, and I'm just left with the sum of all the forces on the left side have to be equal to zero. And then isn't that really what we have in the up and down direction too? So if the sum of all the forces equals zero, then that means all of the forces pulling to the right, which in both cases are going to be the X components, the U pulling to the right, minus the friction, which is going to the left, has to equal zero, or you can say that your pull has to be equal to the pull of friction. And that's going to be just the special case of when there's a constant velocity, all of the forces cancel out. So take, for example, we have up here a block of 196 Newtons. And if you remember, this was from the first video, we have this that uh, you are pushing to the right with your two Newtons, your buddy who buffed up pushed to the left with uh, negative five Newtons, negative because it's going to the left, and then we have a net force of negative three newtons. So if we want to find out what the acceleration is, then there are a couple different things we need to do. So first off, if we're going to do F equals MA, then don't we need to know what the mass of the object is? So if you think through what gravity is, gravity is a special form of this F equals MA. If the acceleration is the acceleration of gravity, which you remember is 9.8, and then the force has to be the force of gravity, otherwise known as the weight, or sometimes you'll see that as a W. So I can take that 196, plug it into the force, then I, for the weight, I can take the 9.8, plug it into the acceleration and solve for M, and that will give me a mass of 20 kilograms. From there, I can plug that back into F equals MA and say, hey, if the net force was negative three Newtons, I'll put my negative three in here, put in my 20 for my mass, and then solve for acceleration. And I would say that that block is going to accelerate at negative 0.15 meters per second squared. Okay, so to find the mass, you take the weight, divide by 9.8. To find the mass, you take the weight, divide by 9.8. To find the mass, you take the weight and divide by 9.8. So it's a trick. You always have to know both the weight and the mass in these problems. Next up. So think through these problems. What we did in kinematics was we used these five kinematic variables and these three kinematic equations to describe the motion of the object using acceleration, velocity, position, and time. And now what's connecting us to the new chapter is that acceleration again, where we have a net force from F equals MA. So these problems will act one of two ways. They'll either give you the kinematics ask you to solve for A and then ask you from A what the net force is or a specific force, or they'll give you the forces, you use the forces to find the acceleration, and then you use the acceleration and the kinematics to find out what one of those kinematic variables are or is. So let's do a sample problem. You pull a 50 Newton block with a force of 15 Newtons at 26 degrees. So drawing a force diagram, here's my block. Remember, I'm going to put a dot right smack in the center of the block. 
and I want to start thinking through what are the forces acting on it. So the first thing I would think is I have gravity pulling straight down. Now remember, we always have to know both the weight and the mass of the object. So now that I have that gravity, I, up here it tells me it's a 50 Newton block. So I'm going to plug in 50 Newtons. I'm going to plug in 9.8 for my gravity. And then I'm going to solve and I get a mass of 5.10 kilograms. So next. I also know that I'm pulling with 15 Newtons at 26 degrees. And so, hey, guess what? That 15 Newtons isn't in the X or Y direction. So the first thing we're going to have to do is break that into components. It's X and Y components. And remember Y sine because X is cosine. So I'm going to say the Y value will be 15 sine 26. The X value will be 15 cosine 26. And that's how big each of those uh, arrows are or vectors. Nextly, we want to find out what the normal force is. So is our object or is this block that you're dragging moving up or down at all? And the answer would be no. Nothing in the problem indicates that this is moving up and down. So if it's not moving up and down, then don't these two forces on the top have to balance out this force on the bottom? So the 50 Newtons pulling down has to be canceled out by the 6.58 plus the normal force. And that's really how I'm going to go about finding the normal force. So my acceleration up and down is zero. I can say the normal plus the Y because those are my up forces minus gravity because that's my down force equals zero. And then plug my numbers in and solve for what the normal force is. So my normal force will be 43.4 Newtons. So together that 43.4 plus the 6.58 has to equal the 50 Newtons pulling down. Now keep in mind that's not the mass. It has to equal the 50 Newtons, which is the weight. We still haven't used that mass yet. It's coming up. Part E, find the acceleration of the block if friction is 4 Newtons. So we have one more force to draw on here, and that's going to be our force of friction. And that force of friction is going to go to the left. It's going to act against the object's motion. So if that friction is 4 Newtons, then I can set up my F equals MA in the X direction and just say that my X <clears throat> has to be that 5.10 was the mass. We found that down here. Then my net force in the X direction, so remember that all these Y's canceled out and I'm only left with these two. I'm gonna have the 13.5, which is moving to the right, minus the four, which is moving to the left, has to equal that 5.10 times A, and that's gonna be the acceleration of your block is from using the Newton's second law in the X direction. So lastly then, remember if we're looking at that chart from earlier, now that we have the acceleration, can't we find some kinematic variables? Find the block's final velocity. So I'm gonna be looking for VF after three seconds, which is gonna be my time. And I'm probably going to have to make an assumption that my initial velocity was zero, that the block was sitting still to begin with. So what equation has VF, VI, A, and T in it? And that's really going to be your second equation. VF equals VI plus AT. So plug in your zero, plug in your 1.86, plug in your three, and then multiply for your force to get, a, I'm sorry, not your force, to get a final velocity of 5.59 meters per second. So remember, Newton's second law, we're dealing with F equals MA. When we look at the math behind it, we're talking about F equals MA in the Y direction, which usually cancels out. So all the forces up have to equal all the forces down. And then we're also dealing with F equals MA in the side to side direction. And they don't usually cancel out unless you're moving at a constant velocity. And when they don't cancel out, then the difference between those forces is what causes your object to accelerate. And that's sort of a summary of Newton's second law along with the sample problem to go with it.